The borrow checker is one of the main sources of value in building something in Rust, and a Rust developer can cover quite a bit of ground while abiding by the borrow checker's rules. But there are certain situations where you might need to work around the borrow checker to do what you need to do. One of the most common mechanisms for doing this is called interior mutability, which unfortunately is a term that some developers have a visceral reaction to, which might be a bit unwarranted. Leveraging interior mutability is actually fairly straightforward, but understanding why we need interior mutability can be more difficult than actually using it. The key thing to remember is that the rules of the borrow checker and forces are designed to guarantee memory safety. What the borrow checker is not designed to do is allow all programs that are memory safe. That's an important distinction to be aware of. The unfortunate reality is that static code analysis, which rejects all programs that are not memory safe, but accepts all programs that are memory safe, isn't really feasible, at least at the time this video is being made. By the time you watch this, ChatGPT might have a solution already. Because of this, Rust uses a set of constraints that are enforceable and guarantee memory safety, but unfortunately reject an entire class of programs that are memory safe. In other words, there's a set of memory safe programs that the borrow checker just won't allow. It's easy to show an example of one. Say we have a graph of connected nodes that each contain some integer value. Graphs by their very nature require there to potentially be multiple references to the same node. In this case, both nodes B and C have references to node A. Now this isn't a problem if all we need to do is read the graph, but if we want to change the value contained in any of the nodes, the Rust borrow checker is going to step in and say nope. Because there are potentially many shared references in existence, we won't be able to mutate the values of any of the nodes. That's that's where interior mutability comes in. The first thing we want to do is come up with a way of storing a node. So we'll make a struct node, and it's going to have an i32 value and a vector of adjacent nodes. You might notice a problem here, but we're going to leave it that way for now. Then we'll create our main function. One for the val, and then a is going to have an empty vector for adjacent. And then we're going to have node implement debug so we can print it easier. Test that really quick, make sure it works. Cool. So we get our node, which has a value of one and an empty adjacent list. As you saw from the diagram, we want to have nodes B and C both point to node A. So let's try creating those. Okay, so there's a problem here. Node has a field called adjacent, which holds a vector of owned nodes. So when we pass in A to the vector of adjacent nodes for B, we're actually passing ownership to that vector. So when we try to print it down here, it's gonna say use of move value A, values used after move, which is on, on this line, line 15. We're gonna have the same problem with node C when we create node C because we're gonna be trying to use a moved value. So there's no way to have both B and C point to A if our node structure is gonna have a vector of owned nodes. So the only way to get around that is to have adjacent be a vector of shared references to node. Let's try to do that. The Rust compiler doesn't want a situation where a node lives longer than all of the nodes that it has references to. So for that, we're gonna to need to create a lifetime. Now that the adjacent field of our node holds a vector of shared references to another node, we can pass in a shared reference to A when we create node B. And same thing with node C. So we're gonna copy most of that code. It's gonna be node C. Okay, all is well so far. Let's make sure this works. So we've successfully created a graph where nodes B and C both have references to node A, but the main function of our Rust program still maintains ownership of all the nodes. That comes in handy when we wanna do the debug output. So, so far we have no problem. Now let's look at a scenario where we want to update the values of each of the nodes. Say we wanna write a function that takes a node as input and it'll add one to all the nodes in that graph. Okay, we can't add one to the value because the parameter of the add one function is a shared reference to a node. In order to mutate the state of that parameter, we're gonna have to either accept a mutable reference as a parameter or full ownership of the thing that was passed in. Let's try full ownership first. Okay, that doesn't really work because we can mutate the value of the node that got passed in, but we have no way of mutating the value of the adjacent nodes because the adjacent vector is a vector of shared references to nodes. A mutable reference isn't gonna work either because we have shared references in the adjacent vectors of each node, and we can't grab a mutable reference or exclusive reference if there's existing shared references or read-only references. So really the only way to do this is to accept a shared reference as a parameter but again, we can't mutate the value. So let's take a step back for a second. The borrow checker is not letting me mutate this value, but there's also nothing unsafe memory-wise in this program. Say I'm calling add one on node B, 
and say it let me compile add one as is. Is there anything unsafe memory-wise about this program? No, there aren't any race conditions. There's no potential for dangling references as long as all these nodes live as long as each other. So how do we get around this in Rust? Again, I mentioned a common mechanism for solving this problem is interior mutability. To implement interior mutability directly, you'd have to use unsafe code blocks. Luckily, the Rust standard library has three smart pointers that implement interior mutability under the hood so that when used externally, they're actually safe to use, even though they use unsafe blocks under the hood. And those are cell, ref cell, RW lock, and mutex. We're gonna try to use cell here. If we actually wrap the value in each node in a cell. So instead of I32, this is gonna be a cell of I32. What cell does is it actually allows us to mutate the contained value, even if we only have a shared reference to that cell. The way it does this is by allowing you to mutate the value, but never allowing you to get a shared reference. You can either mutate the value or you can get a copy of the value inside. So it never has to worry about dangling references. Cell has a get function to get a copy of what's inside. The get function of the cell is actually gonna grab a copy of what's inside. So if you wanna use that get function, which typically I think you would, if you're using a cell, the thing that you're putting in the cell has to implement the copy trait, which in our case, I32 does implement copy. String doesn't, so you might wanna use something else for string. We'll get to that in a minute. First, we'll use cell's get function here. So let curveval, we're gonna grab the current value. Node.val.get is gonna get us a copy of the I32, not a shared reference to the I32. And then we're gonna call set. Again, remember that node is a shared read-only reference to a node. It's not a mutable reference. It's not an owned type. So despite that, we're still able to set the value. And like I said, that's because cell never gives out shared references. It only allows you to mutate or grab a copy of what's inside. That completely eliminates the possibility of an issue with dangling references or data consistency. Now that val is a cell of I32s, we actually need to create a cell each time we instantiate one of these nodes. So we do that with cell new. We do have an issue up here with this node.adjacent in the for each loop. Node.adjacent is moved due to this implicit call to into iter. By default in a for loop, if you do for each on some collection, it's gonna implicitly call dot into iter, which is gonna take ownership of the things that you're iterating over. So we need to explicitly call dot iter, which is gonna grab a shared reference instead, which is what we want. We definitely don't wanna take ownership of the stuff that's in the adjacent vector. When we called node.val.set, I wasn't adding one. So let's add one. And down here, we're calling add one on node B and printing out node A and B. Okay, so now node B has a value of three and node A has a value of two. That's what we expect. So if you have a piece of data that's copyable and you don't mind copying it, it's not gonna be a huge performance hit, which is the case with something like an I32. Cell might be the best mechanism for doing interior mutability. But what if you have something that's not copyable like a string? Well, let's try changing this to a string. The trait bound string copy is not satisfied. So the real issue here is get has the trait bound for copy on it. That's why the compiler is complaining when I call dot get. String is not copyable. So if I want to call dot get on the cell, the thing that's stored inside needs to be copyable and string is not, nor would we want to copy it in this situation. There is another smart pointer called rough cell that allows for interior mutability, but doesn't necessarily require that the contained type be copyable. Let's change all these cells to rough cell. And since we're dealing with strings now, let's change these to string values. Instead of adding one to the value contained in the node, why don't we say we're gonna add an exclamation mark to the string contained in the node? So this will be add urgency. Still gonna take a shared reference to a node. Rough cell imposes some rules that are actually sort of similar to the borrow checker, but they're imposed at runtime instead of compile time. It has two main methods, borrow and borrow mute. And borrow mute is kind of like getting an exclusive reference or a mutable reference in the context of the borrow checker. And borrow is kind of like getting a shared reference. In this case, we want a mutable reference. So instead of dot get, we're gonna call dot borrow mute. And then we can operate directly on the string once we have that mutable reference and we're gonna push an exclamation character onto the string. Again, I mentioned that the way ref cell works is sort of like the borrow checker, but at runtime, which means if you call dot borrow on the shared reference, and then you call dot borrow mute after that, it's actually gonna panic or vice versa. If you wanna be safe, there is another function called try borrow mute, which actually returns a result. So it'll return an error if you can't get the mutable reference and it will return okay if you can. In this case, we know there's no possibility of this value being borrowed, so we can just call borrow mute. Just add urgency. Go ahead and run this. 
Oh, oops. We have to make this a mutable value. So curve out needs to be mutable for us to be able to push onto the string. Cool, okay, so we got our exclamation mark that we were looking for. So if cell's not gonna work because the value you wanna contain is not copyable or you wouldn't want it to be copyable because of performance reasons, ref cell is kind of the next step. The downsides of ref cell is that you have the potential of panicking if your program attempts to get a mutable reference at the same time there's a shared reference out or vice versa. So cell can be a little more convenient than ref cell if your use case allows for that. Okay, here comes a really interesting part. What if we wanna add urgency in a separate thread and maybe we wanna call add urgency concurrently in two different threads. Let's see how to do that. Okay, so what happened here? We're trying to call thread spawn and then call add urgency in that thread. Let's do some thread joins here. We need to name this thread actually. T1.join. So we make sure it finishes before we get to the debug part. Okay, ref cell string cannot be shared between threads safely. Sync is not implemented for ref cell. So what if we need interior mutability across different threads? The next step in our evolution is RW lock, which is similar to ref cell, but it can be used in a multi-threaded situation. So let's try changing this ref cell to RW lock. RW lock is not unique to Rust at all. It's actually a pretty common mechanism used in situations where only one thread can modify the data at any given time. And while modifying the data, nobody else can read the data or one to many people can read the data. So this is still sort of like the borrow checker in the sense that there can be only one writer or one or more readers, but never both at the same time. But the way it works is a little bit different. So if you were to get a write reference to RW lock, you do that via the write function and that returns a result. So we're gonna unwrap that. This would fail in situations where somebody has acquired the RW lock and then panicked. That's the only situation where this would actually return something other than okay. We're not particularly worried about that scenario for this program, but something to be aware of. So in this program, we're just gonna unwrap. By the way, this program as written right now doesn't actually handle the case where there's a cycle in the graph. To do that, we'd have to maintain some kind of list of visited nodes. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really relevant to interior mutability. I'm trying to keep the code simple. We do wanna release this lock as soon as possible. So I'm gonna put this in some curly braces. So immediately after we push to the string, we release the write lock and so it can be acquired again. So now our add urgency function is pretty much squared away using RW lock, but there's some other problems. What does this say here? A does not live long enough. This is because now that we're passing things to other threads, the compiler is concerned that those threads might live longer than the current function. And so we need some way to handle that. And the way we do that is with an arc. So instead of using a just a straight up vector of references for adjacent, we actually need to convert this to an arc of vector of nodes. That way when these things are moved to other threads, each thread has a strong reference to the data. And so the data is guaranteed to not be cleaned up until all the strong references are gone. We're gonna wrap all these nodes in arcs. And now we can actually create a clone of the node that we passed to the other thread. For good measure, why don't we create another thread while we're at it uh, that calls at urgency on node C and see what happens there. Then when we actually go to print the debug output, we need to dereference this arc first. So we'll add a asterisk there. So we have the potential that both these threads might operate on node A at the same time. What's gonna happen in that situation? Well, this write method actually will block until it can acquire the lock. So if thread one has a lock on node A, thread B comes to node A and tries to grab the right lock, uh, it's actually gonna block until it can acquire that lock. So that's sort of different from ref cell where if you call borrow mute and there's already a borrow out somewhere, it'll actually panic. RW lock will actually block the current thread until it can get the lock. And of course you need to be cognizant of deadlocks because of that. But in our case, when both threads try to grab the lock of val of node A, the one that gets there last is gonna actually block until the first one is released. And then the, the second one will grab the lock and perform the modification and everything will be fine. If all goes well, we should see two exclamation marks added to the value of node A. Cool, so we do see that. Node A has two exclamations. That leaves only one more smart pointer that I mentioned, and that is mutex. You'll notice that even though we're using RW lock, we're actually only ever acquiring a write lock to the data. We're never acquiring a read lock. A mutex is sort of a simpler version of RW lock in that it's, there's just a, a general lock. There's no concept of read locks and write locks. It's just a lock. And if one thread has a lock, the other threads trying to get that lock are gonna block until they get the lock. Wow, that was 
rhyme -y. So we could, because we're not actually utilizing the functionality of RW lock by getting the read lock, we could just convert this to a mutex. And then instead of dot write, we're gonna just call dot lock to acquire the lock. And we're gonna encapsulate all the values in mutexes instead of RW lock. Okay, we should be good to go. All we did is instead of encapsulating our val in an RW lock, now it's in a mutex, and instead of calling dot write, we're trying to get the lock, we're calling dot lock. And it should work the same way. When thread one tries to get the lock and nobody has it, it's gonna acquire the lock and do the modification. Thread two tries to come in and acquire the lock while thread one has it. It's gonna block until thread one is done, thread one's done, and thread two acquires the lock and does its modification. So we should still see two exclamation marks for node A. And we do. That's mutex. That's a rundown of how to sneak past the Rust borrow checker using interior mutability and what sorts of scenarios might necessitate such a thing. For more idiomatic Rust development, check out this video on Rust's result and option enums and some interesting ways to use and convert between them. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.